Buenos días a, a todas y a, y a todos. Encantados de poderos saludar de manera virtual. Nos hubiera encantado ¿no? a, a poderlo hacer de manera presencial, eh, como ya vamos haciendo los últimos uh, seis años, pero que, bueno, como hemos comentado, uh, haciendo este ejercicio de responsabilidad uh, colectiva, decidimos ayer finalmente, viendo los números y las últimas recomendaciones, a uh, saltar al, al formato 100% uh, uh, virtual. Eh, como sabéis, uh, y os decía, esta es la, la sexta edición del, del Congreso, que como, como buenos tecnólogos uh, nos hemos ido adaptando con, con el nombre también. Uh, ahora lo llamamos AI and, and Big Data Congress. Como, como sabéis, nosotros pretendemos ser el, el, el punto de, de conexión uh, anual entre los profesionales de los, de los datos y los algoritmos en, en, en Cataluña una vez al año. Uh, y para esto intentamos seleccionar varios de los casos de éxito o aplicaciones de las tecnologías o desarrollos más innovadores que vemos en, en nuestro país. Eh, esto lo, lo, lo acabamos de adornar con algunas uh, charlas de, de estrategia o, o keynote uh, speakers eh, de ámbito internacional que nos, nos proveen un poco desde, desde su versión, eh, desde empresas uh, líderes en, 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 en el mundo. Entonces, uh, hoy, como sabéis, es, normalmente tenemos dos días. El primero eh, más enfocado a, a pensando en, en, en jefes de, de equipo, jefes departamentales. Tenemos las charlas estratégicas, los keynotes y, uh, y muchos casos de éxito que esperamos que sean inspiradores para muchos de, de vosotros. Y luego tenemos un segundo día, mañana, eh, pensando más en un eh, perfil uh, tecnólogo, data engineers, data scientists, AI, AI engineers, donde vamos a ver un poco más las tripas de, de la tecnología y explicar uh, cómo, cómo se solventan varios, varios de los retos. Entonces, sin, sin más dilación, vamos a dar inicio a la primera, a la primera sesión de, de contenido del, del Congreso, que es el, el keynote uh, de, de Uriol Viñals, eh, lo introduciré. Antes de darle paso, eh, eh, Uriol Viñals es Principal Scientist de, de, de Google DeepMind y responsable del equipo de Deep Learning. Su trabajo se centra en el aprendizaje profundo y la inteligencia artificial. Antes de unirse a DeepMind, Uriol formaba parte del equipo de Google Brain. Él tiene un doctorado en Electrical Engineering and Computer Science de la Universidad de California en Berkeley y recibió el premio innovador MIT PR35 en 2016 para los innovadores más brillantes menores de 35 años. Su investigación ha sido presentada en varias eh, ocasiones en journals como New York Times, Financial Times, Wired, la BBC, entre otros, y sus artículos han sido citados más de 75.000 veces. Es una, una barbaridad. Algunas de sus contribuciones, como sec to sec Knowledge Distillation o Tension Flow, se utilizan actualmente en varios de los productos de Google, como Google Translate, Text to Speech and Speech Recognition, que son utilizados en miles de millones de consultas cada día. Y además fue el investigador principal del proyecto de AlphaStar, eh, creando un agente que rotó a uno de los mejores profesionales del juego de StarCraft, e incluso alcanzando al nivel de Grand Master y apareció en la portada de la prestigiosa revista Nature. Él, en DeepMind, continúa trabajando en sus áreas de interés, que incluyen la inteligencia artificial, con especial énfasis en el Machine Learning, el Deep Learning y el Reinforcement Learning. Eh, Uriol, eh, muchas, muchas, muchas gracias por estar hoy, hoy con nosotros y compartir un poco tu experiencia y tu visión eh, con todos nosotros. Muchas gracias y cuando quieras. Um, muchísimas gracias, Marc. Uh, voy a dar la charla en inglés principalmente, pero quería, pues, uh, primeramente, obviamente, uh, pues, agradecer el, pues, la organización y, y el, el, la invitación a, a formar parte del Congreso. Um, obviamente, son tiempos un poco extraños y difíciles. Tengo aquí la, uh, una, una imagen de la Tierra para un poco recordar que este año está siendo muy difícil para todos. Um, ahora mismo, pues, es un poco pues no ortodoxo, no estar desde, desde casa dando una presentación sin ver y conectar con el público. 
Uh, espero que pues, podamos uh, discutir tanto pues, en la ses sesión de eh, Q&A como, como pues, pues, online, por ejemplo, si queréis pues, um, continuar ¿no? la, la conversación que o tendríamos pues, en persona si estuviéramos todos juntos. Um, pero bueno, es, es bueno reflexionar pues, de, los, de los cambios que, que el mundo nos... nos, pues, nos, nos y luego tenemos que innovar, ¿no? Se ha dicho mucho ya en, en esta mañana, pero eh, la inteligencia artificial tiene, tiene pues, un rol a, 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 a la parte de innovación y de intentar, pues, um, especialmente ahora que estamos un poco menos conectados, pues, conectarnos más los unos a los otros. Y, obviamente, también, um, pues, políticamente es, es un, es un, son tiempos difíciles globalmente, claramente con, con muchas... Uh, muchas noticias viniendo de pues, Inglaterra, que es donde vivo yo, Estados Unidos, que es de donde hice mi doctorado y, y trabajé en Google Brain, y, etc. ¿no? Entonces, um, pues intentar que el mundo sea, sea un sitio mejor es, es una cosa mucho más para la inteligencia humana que para la inteligencia artificial, y espero pues, que todo mejore y que todos estéis bien en casa, uh, dadas las circunstancias. Dicho esto, eh, voy a empezar, voy a hacer un switch uh, al inglés. Obviamente para las preguntas, uh, catalá, castellano, English, todo, todo va bien. Uh, good. All right. So let me switch to, to English. Um, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks really for, for attending this talk. I was asked to give a fairly sort of high level talk, not very deeply technical talk, which is Uh, an interesting challenge since I am actually like a researcher in deep learning, which means that I usually get to see um, and witness sort of the innovations before they become mainstream. Uh, but I'll do my best at trying to give you a bit of like the trajectory that the field has taken in the last few years, really, and also some personal experiences by uh, some of the results and, 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 and research that we've done um, both at Google and at DeepMind in the last four or five years that I've, I've been in, the, in, in DeepMind and then the last three, the, the previous three years I was over in California in Google. And so it's, it's, it's kind of, you hear these terms a lot and, and it's a bit, it's a bit, it gets a bit confusing for, for probably a good reason, um, but let me, let me just um, tell you that you know, there's obviously these terms, artificial intelligence, we hear quite often. And this is more like the grand project to build non-human intelligence. Machine learning, which gets confounded a lot lately, it's about, um, you know, machines that learn from data, mostly, to be smarter, to make decisions about, like, images, speech, and so on. And the talk today, I'll, I'll explain a lot more about machine learning, really, than artificial intelligence, although one is contained in the other. And then there are other things you might hear, um, especially if you start reading more specialized uh, literature, which is deep learning, um, which is a big area now, supervised learning, reinforcement learning. And really what has happened in the last few years is that machine learning and deep learning has grown so much that it often gets confounded and confused with the term artificial intelligence. But I wanted to make sure that it is clear these are not the same um, and you know that anytime you read these interchangeably you should you should maybe try to understand that um what most people talk about these days is machine learning and sometimes it's only a deep learning which is a set of of uh, models that we build for doing machine learning now that being said it's it's obviously true that uh, there's been a tremendous growth uh, and i'll try to tell you from my perspective and from Google's perspective um, why this growth has happened in the last 10 years or so. These are just the Google trends of uh, some of these key terms that I just described over time, how people were looking for these. Artificial intelligence actually um, has been kind of up there, kind of almost constant, but deep learning, machine learning have kind of exponentially grown. Um, and as a result also, Things like investment into startups, uh, especially in Silicon Valley, has grown from almost non-existent in terms of how much it, there is investment in, in startups in Silicon Valley to, you know, tens of billions of dollars invested every year. And so as a result, it's, it's a bit awkward and weird that as a researcher, you get interviewed by mainstream media um, and it's, it's kind of almost, you know, a new thing, a new experience. Uh, in the, fir the first time I talked to, you know, uh, a reporter, 
uh, that was from New York Times, actually, that was kind of a bizarre experience. But, but you know, it, you know, it, it's also our responsibility uh, as researchers to try to educate uh, the press, because um, oftentimes when I read an article uh, about my field, I feel like it doesn't represent quite well what's happening. Um, maybe this talk hopefully helps you a little bit more. And then for those who who are specialists, then obviously you can always read um, the many research articles that appear uh, every day, which is one of the revolutions I'm gonna about, I'm about to uh, describe to you. So again, like the impact of uh, machine learning is is global. Um, this there's obviously notable absences mostly in South America and Africa, but there's been some very good initiatives to bring machine learning everywhere. In fact, uh, just over a year actually ago, I was in Montevideo in one of the first conferences in artificial intelligence there, um, which was really, um, really special moment for, for the whole continent. But um, clearly, you know, China, Japan, um, Asia, India, Europe, the US, uh, machine learning is really prevalent now um, amongst startups, big companies, uh, universities, of course, etc. So let me begin with maybe a non-obvious revolution that has happened thanks to uh, the dot-com boom and, and the internet boom, really, um, which is that of data centers. So this picture is actually from, um, I believe, Jeff, who is, uh, who is one of the first employees at Google, and he shared this picture, uh, which were basically the very first computers that were running google.com back in the 90s, right? So if you access Google, when you know Google was very, very you know everyone used Alta Vista. I remember using that that myself a lot. Uh, but you know Google was a very small search engine, and initially it was run literally you know on this set of machines you see here, right? So that gives you a lot of perspective of, of like how you know how things start as well, which is which is uh, very humble starts. That's very often the case uh, in technology. Uh, which which creates these very inspiring stories, you know, in your in the garage, someone has an idea and tries to execute it. Of course, there are many failure cases as well. You only see usually the successful ones. So, feed forward, really just a few months maybe or or, or years, um, Google data centers start looking a bit more serious. Uh, this is uh, in the in the computer history. Um, uh, museum in in down in in Silicon Valley, uh, they have these exposed. This is one of the early Google servers. Uh, the G here is for Google, and I guess they had you know some racks in this in this particular uh, image, like 60 and so on. And now things got a bit a bit bigger. I mean, Google I believe was doubling um, in in sort of number of search and queries. I don't know how often, but it was really like exponentially like growth um, uh, in the early days. So obviously they had to accommodate for more and more data servers. And nowadays these data servers, which are spread across the planet, um, they look super nice and super cool um, as opposed to those very first computers under the desk that they had. And you know, this, this, is, this is an important revolution because this amount of compute let us obviously process a lot of, uh, the, or train rather a lot of the models that um, I'll describe in a second. But another revolution that's been happening in parallel and probably not independently is that, well, if you go, this is the data center from inside, right? So, you know, what, what is in the data center, right? What's in the data center has also been changing. And the hardware revolution, I think, um, especially in deep learning and probably also in machine learning has owed is, is sort of, it's almost like a random effect that happened thanks to um, GPUs, you might, you might know this story obviously quite well, but GPUs or graphical processor units um, that are used for video games. Um, I, I, play, I play video games as a kid. I used to play StarCraft. It was very fun to, play, to also work on AlphaStar, as Mark was saying, um, on building an agent that plays the game. But GPUs happen to be hardware that specialized for, for matrix operations, matrix multiplications, which happen to be critical to render sort of the, the voxels that you see when you render a video game. And GPUs start taking over, um, obviously, in the early 2000s, perhaps, um, with gaming industry. Um, and what was cool to see, and actually, I was very fortunate to be at Berkeley at the time, where Brian Catanzaro, who is now a vice president at NVIDIA, 
presented a class project. This was a class project that accelerated the training of super vector machines, which was you know, the, the latest, I guess, in machine learning at the time. I think this was 2007 or 2008. And he presented training those models that require matrix multiplications using GPUs instead of CPUs. And I remember he, his class, class project said, oh, there's a 140x speed up, right? So something that took um, 140 seconds to train took now one single second in one of these GPUs. And from there on, many people started realizing the power, the compute power behind the graphical cards. And thanks to that, um, a lot of the deep learning revolutions were enabled. And in fact, this was so much the case that now companies such as Google started building hardware specialized for deep learning, even more specialized than GPUs were, because GPUs obviously ultimately are um, for rendering graphics. At the same time, of course, NVIDIA also realized the potential of, of AI, machine learning, um, and deep learning. And nowadays, they held conferences and they have huge interest and research groups. In fact, I'll show you one of the results later from NVIDIA, the, the, one of the main producers of GPUs in the world, where they actually invest a lot in deep learning research uh, because it's obviously of interest to also utilize their hardware and their GPUs are getting better and better um, at deep learning um, and possibly at the expense of being worse at video games, which is quite, um, quite an uh, ironic uh, perspective as well. Um, I know they're also get, getting better at, at mining Bitcoins, but that's a topic I'm not going to touch on today. Cool. So now you take these, these massive TPUs, very cool design from a hardware perspective, and you put them together in, in sort of a almost, it, it's called, this is called a donut internally because it, it, it forms like a ring of connections between all these TPUs. So you can imagine having one of these TPUs in every of these racks, I think there's, 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 you can almost see them here. Um, and then you connect them and you get these massively parallel, pretty compact for supercomputer sizes, um, computing device that is, um, you know, a TPU cluster that lives in that massive data center that I showed the picture of earlier. And in fact, these, in terms of compute power, um, obviously these numbers get outdated rapidly because um, we have like doubling compute capacity still every 18 months or so. But these, you know, these relatively small, I guess a person would be, you know, maybe as tall as a bit, a bit, a bit shorter than these racks, but it, this is not gigantic. Um, this has 11 petaflops of compute, which is a lot of compute for such a small space. And in fact, um, at the time that this study was done, this single rack of TPUs for which there are many, of course, in the data centers and in the cloud for users to use as well around the world, this would have ranked in isolation number 10 in supercomputers um, in, in, in this metric. So this is quite daunting almost, amount of compute, a scale of compute. Um, but that, of course, has to come with another revolution, which you know probably you're more familiar with, which is the data revolution. And what's interesting, maybe something that's not very widely known um, as maybe a practitioner, is that data is actually, generally speaking, more critical to enable breakthroughs than algorithms, right? So, for instance, if you look at um, one of the breakthroughs in AI, maybe that everyone uh, here might, might be familiar with, uh, which was when IBM Deep Blue defeated, defeated the, the grandmaster Gary Kasparov at chess. Well, it turns out that the algorithms um, were known for quite a while from instead, for actually, in fact, 1983. So the algorithms had been developed um, a while back. It's only when some data sets about chess started to become available that they were able to train some, some basic heuristics and, 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 and models that enabled their search algorithm in that case to be so good. And this, for many of the breakthroughs, um, actually applies. In fact, for the maybe the one that enabled more notably the deep learning revolution, um, ImageNet, well, you know, the convolutional neural networks by and large were invented, um, you know, and, and discovered in the 90s uh, or early, or like late 80s rather. There are some critical things that were needed that were added on top of this basic algorithm, but only in 2000, let's say 12, 13, 14, image recognition started to be so good. And it was using these kind of algorithms 
on a data set that was very carefully collected by a group led by Fei Fei Li at Stanford, where they basically took uh, the idea of automatically or rather asking humans um, to label a large amount of images, 1 million um, plus. Uh, and then these data set enabled sort of the breakthrough of being very good at computer vision, at least on this particular task. So this is important, right? Like data is actually quite important, not only collecting the data, but making sure the data um, is clean, that you define a metric that's reasonable for researchers to work on um, for a while, right? This, this data set took a few years actually to, to, uh, for, for, for the actual breakthrough to happen, but it's still um, data sets and data is quite, quite key. And I would say it's definitely like kind of first class in, in terms of why we're seeing what we're seeing today in artificial intelligence um, advancements. And data sets and data as a result has exploded not only in size, but also in the kinds of data that we like to use in our models, right? So um, obviously images, um, text, words and letters are, are obvious modalities and speech. Actually, these are kind of maybe three modalities that are very traditional. There, there's a lot of results in the past, but because of the breakthroughs that we enabled um, and a few other ad advancements in research, um, we start getting data sets about, of course, videos, the amount of video um, uploaded and, and that exist uh, is, is tremendously large. Um, programs, graphs, there's, uh, there's a lot of interesting data modalities that nowadays researchers are trying to find uh, good problems to work on to develop new algorithms. Now, a third revolution is the software revolution. This has been really nice to see. Um, it's not hard to explain because um, this, is, this is probably something you are quite familiar with, which is the fact that a lot of the frameworks that are used nowadays in machine learning internally in the big corporations such as you know, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, and so on, the same software that we use has been open sourced, in fact, by these same companies and now is available for anyone to use, which... I think it really creates the barrier of entry to the field has been lowered tremendously. And this is quite nice because what we then see is that people get creative that are not in these big companies. There's a lot of people in the world that like to play with models and ideas and, and different data modalities and data sets. And then you get very creative usage of machine learning that was not happening in, this, in these companies. Uh, but rather is just someone in the world that has a very peculiar problem and gets very creative. And because the open source, not only, in fact, not only the software, but also the algorithms, um, the, the access to, to kind of the latest and greatest is, is basically the same as, you know, what I have internally when I go and try some experiments in the field. So this has been really, really nice to see. I witnessed against first hand um, because I, as, as Mark said, I was um, in the original sort of TensorFlow release, which was released by Google a few years ago. And it was very nice to be part of the discussions, whether it was a strategically a good decision to open source these. Um, and it was very nice to see the positive impact that it created. And also that um, just the, the leadership um, of Google was really like, um, I would say, very keen to see uh, the tools that were developed so carefully for internal use that will um, also released externally. And last but not least, and that of course touches more upon my world, right, is the research revolution. So here are a few plots that again show this, this kind of exponential trends. Uh, this one we'll get back to. This actually is about the number of papers that are released um, per month uh, and you can see how there's a lot of papers that are released per month in machine learning and artificial intelligence. They're really like a lot, so much that it's impossible to even read all of them. So it's very hard to maybe discern which papers are truly remarkable and which papers are just incremental and so on and so forth. Um, but this really tells you the amount of research being done in universities and of course companies and just research also done by people like that are just self-educated really because there's lots of materials online. Um, in fact, a very nice story is that some uh, there was a New Rips conference, uh, which is this, this conference here in, in Barcelona, um, actually in 2016. And I met a 14 year old um, person from, from, from Barcelona. And 
this person dropped out of school, I think was was a bit bored and was just learning deep learning. And I, I now this person works at OpenAI um, and I am very kind of happy to have sort of advised and, and help this person guide through like the process of being a researcher in, in AI and so on, right? So there's really a lot of things you can do just by browsing the papers, the source code and tutorials that people write about uh, all these techniques that I'm presenting more superficially today, of course. Um, and as I was saying, these papers generally are presented at conferences and the growth of conferences in deep learning is such that um, I think this was 2018, um, a conference sold out in 12 minutes, which is, I think, as fast as a Beyonce concert sold out, um, you know, the same year, right? So it, it feels a bit like, again, this bizarre world where conferences used to be this place where only a few of us went, like 20, 30, 40 people, you knew everyone, to now having these explosive um, sort of apparatus, uh, tens of thousands of people attending um, AI conferences, and it's really daunting, it's really fun to have seen the change. Um, and I think this conference was the same one that, you know, um, Elon Musk participated, came to talk about AI and, and, and so on. And, you know, in these conferences, Mark Zuckerberg came to the 2014 conference, actually, um, in Europe. So that was fairly early days, right? Uh, but yeah, it's really interesting to see the amount of attention that AI is getting nowadays. So with that, I hope, you know, I conveyed a bit the reasons why we're seeing such a revolution, or at least the reasons I see as, as, as main drivers. Um, and thanks to that, we start getting this, what I call a toolbox. This is really more like a machine learning toolbox. Um, it's not so much about the techniques, but, you know, there's quite a few platforms you can run your models, the cloud, or you can just buy, you know, this hardware in some occasions, frameworks, data sets, right? These are very important sort of building blocks to build uh, models for those in the audience that, that do it. I mean, obviously that, that's the kind of almost the, the starting 101 point for any kind of project that you're trying to decide whether it's worth pursuing for your startup or the company you work for. Um, and then these revolutions um, obviously create also a tension between what's possible and thanks to mostly all of these and then what's achieved by the community in terms of training models that require the amount of training that they require also becomes daunting almost to imagine, especially looking at the, the trend, right? So this is a, a logarithmic plot. So, so you can see there's linear in the you know, modern era as OpenAI put it in this very cool plot. So since 2012 or so, the models um, that, we, that have been released to do a variety of things, it does not matter too much what this every dot represents, but the models have kind of followed a, a steeper exponential growth um, thanks to many of these things kind of happening around here and really compounding. And right now, some of the models require, you know, hundreds of petaflop days to train, right? And you remember that that data server was able to do 10 petaflops. Um, so you need to run that for a few days actually to train the best models, which, which is, you know, and, and obviously if you make the hardware faster, then we will want to train uh, a model that's up here and the trend probably will continue. We'll see when, when it stops, but so far it doesn't seem like there's any slowdown, um, at least given this, this very cool plot uh, from, from OpenAI. So let's zoom in a bit more onto, it's quite exciting um, as a researcher to talk about. I, I'll try to keep it obviously without equations. I, I, was, I was told, please try to keep it as high level as you can, uh, but it, it must be said, something must be said obviously about how these models work, right? So this picture that, that was wonderfully prepared by, by Google, I think shows a bit like the main, the basics of, of what a, a deep learning model, machine learning model, modern machine learning model do, does nowadays. And it also shows a bit what supervised learning is about. So supervised learning uh, is simply put um, from a data set of input examples and output, desired outputs that you want your model to decide automatically, of course, um, you will then train a model, that's this thing in the middle, to perform this task of, well, if you show me this image, I'll tell you whether, you know, in this particular image, there's a cat or a dog, um, right? And there's quite a few things you can do with this framework of inputs. There's some program or model that gets these inputs, processes them, 
through many layers of a neural network. That's that's basically the the main building block, um, or yeah, the main building block in the toolbox for any deep learning uh, researcher. And then at the top, you will decide what's the likelihood or what's the probability, or just you can threshold it and says and just tell me what kind of object is in this image. And to train these, and this is the only sort of pseudo technical thing that I'm gonna show. Um, the algorithm to train these is very simple. It, it's, 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 it was uh, again published many, many years ago. Um, and it goes as follows. You get a very large data set nowadays, right? These, in the, back in the day, these data sets were smaller, but you get a very large data set of input output pairs, right? So input could be an image, output could be you know, the label of the image that you gathered from Amazon Mechanical Turk or something for a while for your data set of interest. And then your algorithm, while not done, you can train these for a few days using a few petaflops as, as was discussed before, but while not done, you pick randomly a training example for the, from this large data set. You run your neural network on X. You, you do inference, as it's called. So you, you just give the, give the X to the program. It, then the, it comes up with a, an answer. This answer will be rubbish, will be garbage um, if you don't train the model, if you, if you start from scratch. But then even if the answer is really wrong, you then say, well, I know the right answer. Please get close to this right answer. Um, and then you sort of update your model using a derivative computation, which, which, is, which is also like very, like a very traditional lead on in numerical optimization. And then you update the parameters and you repeat this. And you repeat this many, many times, right? I mean, even, even the models on images um, that were done in the 2010s or so, these you would be doing literally like trillions of times probably um you can batch images and so on but this is done a lot of times um very quickly by these gpus and hardware um at scale by parallelizing how many training examples you can ingest and you update this model a lot so as to um sort of minimize these laws and and sort of try to regress the inputs to the outputs on the training set and then um, what the model is nowadays, there's quite a few options. The, this is just kind of more pictorically showing the building blocks. Um, the basic ones are obviously feed forward models that take kind of a, fix, a fixed uh, input size, maybe number, like a few numbers that are your features or whatnot. Uh, but there's a lot of different models um, in this talk because the examples are mostly related to sequences and text. Um, we'll see a little bit of sequence prediction, sequence to sequence, and also a bit about the transformer, which is the latest and greatest from sequence modeling. So you not only can do this mapping from a fixed size input, which is an image, which maybe has 300 by 300 pixels, right? Uh, the, way, the way it's usually done in machine learning. Um, but you can do many other things that we know can be done with machines, which is, for instance, understand what someone is saying, right? So as anyone knows, um, speech recognition, it's not perfect. It's okay in English, maybe, I don't know, in Spanish is not so good. In Catalan, um, clearly, because there's not a lot of data, there, it's probably not as good either. But the idea is I speak and then you get subtitles out of what I say automatically, which is a feature that, you know, for instance, YouTube has now enabled um, if, you, if you wish to try it. Uh, it's not perfect, but this is a, a very important application for many reasons uh, that that are obvious, um, such as, you know, talking. You you can speak to your phone, ask it to set alarms, and all these things that that um, at least I do sort of daily on a daily basis. There's also the important task of translating from languages to languages. So obviously, um, we live in a very international world. So. Um, we we read articles, we read news from other countries, and oftentimes you want to translate. So so machine translation that's the the technical name, but everyone hopefully has has used some translation service from Facebook or from Twitter or from Google or from whatnot. Um, this is an important application area that this simple formula that I gave you um, is applicable now, and I'll tell you about this more closely because. Um, this is one of the research experiences that I had kind of as a, as, a, as a researcher from research to production. And then there are other creative things you can do. For instance, you can not only get 
a description of, uh, sorry, like the label of an image, or there's a lion, but more of a like a complete description of an image, which is also an application that um, some companies are even putting as as a service for for you know for compressing images or uh, or, or classifying um, for for search engines, for instance, you can do image search, but then the image will be translated to text, and then it can be indexed more easily, etc. And I, as I said. Um, ImageNet, uh, which hopefully some of you at least have heard, was this kind of breakthrough moment where people in the community, in the research community, started believing that uh, these neural networks, these deep models, were actually something worth of studying. Because, you know, just before AlexNet, which, which is one of the famous models um, invented from Alex Krzyzewski uh, in Toronto, um, before that, you know, you could maybe classify images with a lot of errors, like you know, there, there were like 26% of errors in this particular data set. Humans are estimated to have only about 5% of errors. And then feed forward um, a few a few years, we get models that are beating humans. Um, this doesn't mean that we understand all the images all the time. There are quite a few challenges remaining, but the models have gotten really good at this basic um, idea of just classifying the object uh, in an image. So let me sort of try to convince you even more that the impact of these models is not only like a research exercise, but there's there's real impact that you know probably many of you are interacting with every day. Um, firstly, it's interesting to see the evolution of these, the adoption of these models inside of Google. So this is a graph that shows the amount of deep learning models that were in directories, right, inside of the Google sort of um, ecosystem of, of, of software that we have for all sorts of things that drive, you know, some of the products that hopefully you use, like Gmail, Google Maps, um, you know, search, obviously. <clears throat> and the growth, again, internally was exponential. So it was clear that many software engineers and, and developers inside of Google wanted and started using these models in the products, not only as kind of a research exercise. And really, many of these apps have some components that have machine learning. Um, whether it's deep learning or not is more debatable, but clearly machine learning is in many of, of, of products. In fact, one of the classic examples of machine learning is spam classification, right? So if an email um, is, is, it looks like spammy, then you, you get a model that automatically, I mean, there's obviously billions of emails sent um, probably like per minute, I don't know the numbers, but um, but then many of them are, are spam email and you couldn't possibly have people reading every email and classifying it manually um, for your inbox to be a bit cleaner, right? So machine learning has this power of scaling up what we do as humans. Maybe it's not as good as, as, we, as we are, um, although in some tasks, as you saw, it starts to get very close, but it's much cheaper to then take the, the model that has been trained and then apply it so that every user benefits at scale, right? That's kind of the, the main point really. And so there are quite a few applications that I've used or I've witnessed, I guess, in, in my uh, tenureship at, at, at Google. Um, obviously machine translation is, is, is a big one. This one I've used, I don't know if, if this is enabled in, in Spanish, but in English it certainly is where, you know, you take many pictures right with your phone and then you, you're at home and you say, oh, I'm, I'm you know, this pandemic, I want to see, you know, pictures of sunset, right? But when you took pictures of sunset in your past, past vacations, you didn't take the picture and then went and annotated the picture, right? You don't want to do that. You don't want to take a picture and then say, okay, Oriole is in this picture and this is a picture of a sunset in, in I don't know, in, in Menorca and it's autumn and so on, right? So a lot of these things being automated then allows you to later just revisit these moments and sort of get um, by looking for, you know, a category, you, all the images that fit that category automatically are shown to you, which is which is very useful actually um, for, for many things that I've done. Then other things like speech recognition, very important. I use these a lot um, in English. It's quite good at least. Um, of course, email, spam classification and other things that are going on um, are also cool applications. And then some more like exotic applications like the, the Google self-driving car project um, is kind of notoriously start using, of course, like deep learning, machine learning, and, and also classical AI algorithms, right? It's, it's a fairly complex system. And, you know, this is kind of also a cool project that 
again, it doesn't have an immediate applica applicability because robotics, I mean, as far as the final user knows, um, it's kind of more in the movies and a bit science fiction, but um, this is actually one of the, the Google buildings in, in Mountain View in California, where there's a farm like of robots that are just collecting a data set, right? So this is very important. You start by, you know, getting, getting a few of, of these arms. Um, these arms literally are trying to grab whatever they can grab from this, you know, box that has several objects. And then this data is collected so that then you can start trading models, right? So, you know, th this is more data set collection stage almost in many of these robotics applications. And what's important here is that very cool, this data set that was collected, and of course not everyone can collect this, this data, um, but this data set in particular was shared. So this is a data set that now you can go um, and download and do some research on, right? So the images, whether the robot successfully grabbed something and so on, is, is a public data set that at least researchers start using. It's not that you can create a product from this yet, but it, it's cool to see. Um, Self-driving cars, very cool. I've, I've been in a few of these and, and, and they've really gotten better over time, mostly because more and more data is acquired as well. Um, there's many million dry, uh, miles driven, um, which, which um, now Waymo is collecting. And I, I believe also some of these data sets are actually made public for people to play with. Um, this is a very important application. I think, um, you know, traffic uh, is, is one of the maybe grand challenges of the century. Um, so that's, that's very nice to see like many progress and, and companies doing startups and whatnot doing, doing good progress on this. Um, and then this is a topic that of course today is super relevant, um, but Google has thought about health as one of the areas that are very important as well. Um, for machine learning to have an impact. Um, in fact, um, there are some projects and I've been in the loop with some emails with some of the experts, epidemiologists that are trying to figure out how, how AI and machine learning could help um, in the sort of um, containing the, the spread of, of COVID-19. Uh, but, you know, that, that's, there's still like early days. There's a few things that, that we can discuss maybe um, in the end because it's relevant, especially given what's happening in the last few months. But some health applications that have more successes um, are mostly based on things that doctors do, which is the, a doctor will look at an image uh, at a scan and they spend some time and then they identify some patterns that are concerning um, from a health perspective. Uh, but it turns out that you can somewhat automate this maybe the way i like to see this is you have a, a screening system that is very cheap to run because these literally run in in a machine and it takes milliseconds for for it to come up with an hypothesis whether um this in this patient needs some more attention and then once that system has triggered like a warning then a specialist can dedicate time and obviously doctors and specialists um they require um, more time to look at these images. They're, they're, it's quite expensive, of course. Doctors have, as we know, like high salaries and whatnot. So it's it's nice to see that, especially for countries where even doctors might not might not even be able to 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 take a look at your scans. Um, but if the scans themselves are not super expensive, it's very nice to see that automating part of the process in in medical imaging, especially. Um, has a lot of potential, I think, in the future. So I think some of these we might start seeing have a real world impact very soon. And then I'll skip this one. It's a bit more out there. It's about planet discovery and so on. I like I like astronomy a lot, but I'll skip it. So let me, you know, try to tell you what happens, right? Like how how does a research idea become a product? That's probably quite interesting to some of you, at least, that are probably trying to figure out, right, from all the noise about machine learning and AI, you know, what really is out there that you could you could probably use, or what are the lessons learned, right, from someone who has seen sort of the spectrum from idea creation to then, wow, this now is deployed to billions of users. So I'll start with machine translation. Um, that, that is actually in my career, that was a early, like a, a, an early moment that was very, very important, fundamentally, um, changed me as a researcher, actually, after my, my doing my PhD and, you know, the story is actually quite, quite simple. Um, we had a research idea. There was a data set in which we could show, um, convincing results to the community, like the research community that, that cares about sort of 
the, this comp like a, is a competition, right? Where people every day, every every year, sort of submit systems to translate. But it's very academic in a way, right? It's it's not it's not like um, it's a trivial step, right? From that data set to then something that goes at scale. So this was about 2014. We developed this one of these building blocks, which uh, is called Sequence to Sequence, and you know that was 2014, and it actually took two years of then work by many more people than just the research that was required to sort of invent this new way to train um, these deep neural networks to deal with this particular um, thing, which is mapping um, a sentence to a sentence in a different language. Um, so as you can see, this, this, this is a second paper that was written um, that basically set, uh, kind of announced the deployment at scale, right? That if you go to google.com and you ask it to translate, now we'll, it will run this new system called neural machine translation based on sequence to sequence, right? So it took two full years, right, to, from the research idea and you know some of us were involved in this, but you can also see many more names in this paper because it is complicated, of course, to launch to launch at scale and at production scale these kind of systems. But overall, it improved the quality of Google Translate um, from the previous system, and it closed the gap to kind of how human, how good humans translate from let's say English to Spanish, right? So you know that was an important moment. Translation is not perfect. I use Google Translate sometimes and it, it does make mistakes, but it, it is improving, right? Like 20 years ago versus 10 years ago versus now, it's it's definitely improving thanks to all these kind of revolutions about data, compute and whatnot, and also the research that um, kind of enabled this breakthrough. But note that there's a gap, of course, in the years from this paper to this paper, right? And also the amount of people. This is a pattern you see a lot, right? There's There's Sometimes there might not even be a paper when you productionize some of these research ideas, although oftentimes there is a blog post or something by the company. But it's really like um, interesting to see because this pattern repeats all over. In fact, um, it repeated a few years later as I joined DeepMind, we worked on a model that you know, created uh, you know, waveforms actually, like what the speech looks like. Um, it's just a one dimensional signal that has these very interesting patterns, vibrations that you generate as you speak. And we had a very different approach to generate um, speech or sounds from, from a neural network, basically. Um, I'm not sure if this will play, but one of the cool things we did was also um, generate music. So if you're not listening this, I'm sorry, but this is just kind of a creation from a neural network um, just by listening to a lot of audio. There's a lot of uh, of them in the web nowadays. Many people are generating music with uh, with uh, with neural networks and machine learning. So the pattern is very similar. This obviously happened a bit later, but the paper um, that kind of just said, "Look, there's this benchmark. Um, here is a research idea." Happened in 2016, and this one took just one year, but it required actually some intense research on making this model faster for production. But if you listen now to Android phones um, on English, the voice you hear comes from some now probably improved version of this um, this model called WaveNet that generates human-like speech, but from your phone, right? And again, similar trends and plot really compared to the pre previous systems, like the quality of the speech generated versus what raters regard as human-like speech, which, which has this core, was kind of breached in half. Um, and it, you know, it was one, one step forward to, to very natural sounding voices that are non nonetheless um, still sort of artificial, generated by your phone to tell you something. And then a cool, a cool thing that also has happened very much in, in the same vein as generating um, speech is actually images, right? So um, these this is a model that, um, I mean, this is, this is a line of research really, but this is maybe one of the latest inceptions of the research that has improved this a lot. Um, maybe I should have put the evolution of, of the research because initially um, you would see a generated image from an algorithm that looks very blurry and very bad. But these images, you know, quote unquote, do not exist, right? These are generated by an algorithm who, which looks at the images, understands the nature of images, how each pixel relates to each other pixel in an image, finds these correlations, trains a very powerful model, 
And then you can ask this model to then generate an image um, based on a data set of real images, right? So the, these, these algorithms have seen a lot of data, but then you can generate you know, images that look quite good, the, not always, but sometimes, and they do not kind of exist, right? There's no picture of this kind of dog with this kind of background. And these enabled, I would say, mostly applications um, on based on people that just download these models and get very creative on using this technology. Um, here you can see, you know, again, a person that quote unquote does not exist. Um, there's a few examples. Um, it's very high resolution. It's quite high quality. Um, so these models have really taken off, especially in the last two or three years. A lot of progress has been made in generative models of images. And the actual application that I love that is comes from the graphics card processor and uh, uh, company. And it's almost like an interesting story because you, you have GPUs for video games to render video games. Then people realize, oh, these GPUs can be used to train neural networks, to train models. And now what happened, it went full circle, right? Then NVIDIA themselves realized that we can create high quality images from low quality images using neural networks. So there is an option that if you have an NVIDIA graphics card and you play video games, there is an option where you can use a technology that is called DLSS. This is in the graphic settings of, uh, you know, of, the, of this particular game. And DLSS stands for deep learning super sampling, I think. And what this does is it renders the game kind of low quality, right? It renders the voxels at, at a very low resolution. So here you see like this is actually the original resolution. And if you switch that on, you can see the, the immense quality improvement of the graphics because you're basically rendering them you, know, you render very bad graphics and then you use deep learning to enhance the graphics with technologies like the one I just showed you um, before, right? So this is like what you render and now the GPUs, which also have capacity to do deep learning are using that to enhance the graphics, which I think is a, a fascinating story from a going full circle. Um, so NVIDIA has really had a, like a, a, very, a very interesting insight to do this and more and more of these technologies, machine learning will also enter the world of graphics as we've already seen. Um, that's not something I, I will talk more today, but it's very interesting. So let me sort of wrap up by pointing out some, some frontiers and challenges. And, and it's, it's hard today not to talk about these, especially if you're in research. Um, but let me talk about actually a similar story which was um, at the same time we were generating translations, we also had this, this paper, which was called a neural conversational model, which with the idea of like, oh, you can take, take the same to generate, um, you know, the, generate the translation and you just can train it on a lot of text and try to generate language just for fun. And it turns out that um, a few years later, again, a further paper uh, launched some, something that works on Gmail on, on your phone at least, which allows you to reply emails quickly by basically, okay, given, you know, you receive an email like this, you know, hi, we wanted to invite you to, to such and such Thanksgiving party. Um, there is a, a neural network that, that basically will let you choose, right? Like replies, like kind of pre-populated replies. And this uses like machine learning and many people kind of use this. this. I use this all the, all the time actually, which is, which is quite fun because it allows you to reply quickly and then you can still edit the, the answer and so on. So this was a cool example from kind of almost like funky research of like, oh, can, can we use language models to kind of generate text and you can talk to your language model, right? You, that was the idea to then like uh, uh, something that was launched to, to all the users of Gmail, at least in English initially. And these are some examples we had in this early paper, right? Like, you know, you, you would input something like, oh, what, what do you think about Messi, right? And the machine would just answer just by generating the most likely words. He would say he is a great player or like, you know, or like is the sky blue or, blue or black? And it would kind of, okay, it's blue, right? And this was trained actually on movie subtitles. Um, so we took 900 million words um, included in, in, in a data set that is open to everyone, uh, which includes subtitles of movies. And we just try to predict what dialogues look like. And then we, we ourselves put ourselves into talking to this, uh, to this model. Now, feed forward a few years, um, we get 
data sets like the ones used in these models called GPT-2, GPT-3, they're orders of magnitude bigger. This is 40 billion words, words and 500 billion words, so almost 1,000 million words, right, that you train on. Um, but, you know, the idea is the same, right? And you can see this evolution of the quality of the text generation by looking at the very early models that were, were already like um, kind of introduced by Claude Shannon in the information theoretic work that he was doing back in the 50s. Um, and you can see these models that generate not only images, but now they generate text um, get really, really good, right? So I, I'm not gonna extend too much to leave some time for questions, but you know, the news nowadays is full of like this GPT model that um, in the current deep session is, is from OpenAI, which trains a very big transformer model on a lot of data. And then you can sort of almost let it complete right text, right? You, you write something like in a shocking finding, I don't know, like someone find unicorns. Actually, I'm drinking tea on a unicorn cup. So it's a nice coincidence or not. Um, but anyways, then you ask the model to predict what comes next. What's the most likely word that a human would write? And then you let it write kind of free, free, freely, and it writes text that starts to look very, very good, um, right? So, so, and this is enabled mostly by just scaling up um, the training, scaling up the models, and scaling up the data set. And I wanted to show these. You might have seen these because this is fairly recent, but it writes text. Um, so well that someone from the Guardian, there are some there are some tricks and caveats of this, but a whole article written in the Guardian, um, this one, was written purely by this statistical model of text, right? So you can read this article. I am not a human. I'm a robot, and so on. And there was maybe it's almost like co-writing, right? There was the model writing, but I think then the author of the article was helping it. But it's fascinating to see the jumping quality thanks to these elements, these revolutions that I described very early in the talk. Then there are many interesting applications because um, part of this, this, this model is open that people you know, on the internet found, for instance, this person just asked it to create recipes, uh, cooking recipes from a few ingredients, right? Uh, this one is a bit awkward because I think it's a pancake with tomatoes and um, I think pineapple probably. And there, there's some very interesting applications as well, um, such as, you know, you can write in text, like something like um, a, a text form of an equation in math, and then it will translate it into LaTeX. Um, or very cool, you can, you can just write, describe a website, and then code is generated that will create the website, um, which there are many, many cool demos, like just kind of go and search for GPT-2 or GPT-3 demos. Um, but it's really powerful. It's really, it's really fascinating to see that, you know, the future for these kind of models is, is quite unexplored, but, but I think it's quite vast as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll just finish the talk by just saying that not everything is sort of as, as uh, not all the success stories are, are sufficient to make us believe, okay, AI, we've built artificial intelligence. There are quite a few challenges. Let me just go through them quite quickly. One of them is that we need a lot of data to train, and we humans don't need a lot of data to train new concepts. This adaptability that was mentioned earlier um, in the morning, this is something that these models don't do quite well. Another challenge is that these models can be brittle. So the classic examples you would see if you look for adversarial examples is that you take an image, you add some random perturbations that are imperceptible to, the, to your eye. You, you see this image, it looks pretty much the same as this one. But suddenly the classifier that was so good at classifying images of hamster and, and giraffe and whatever, now is completely confused and outputs a nonsense class, right? So this is kind of a intriguing property, which is, was actually the title of the paper that discovered this, this, this thing from deep neural networks. And then last but not least, I didn't talk today about reinforcement learning, but that's a lot of what we did at DeepMind, um, basically enabling a, different, a slightly different way to train models to, and, and you might have heard, like you play games like um, Atari, Go, StarCraft, and Dota, for instance, like with an algorithm, which is a very cool application. But all of these share the fact that this happens with simulated environments, right? So one of the tricky parts here is that we can simulate physics. There are many physics simulators that create unrealistic solutions to, let's say, asking, I'm asking an algorithm to create a walking avatar but this doesn't look very stable to me. 
Um, and then what happens in reality is that these robots are very, very brittle. And um, you know, this, this gap between the simulator and reality exists and is a main challenge of reinforcement learning. That's all I wanted to say really about uh, reinforcement learning. There's just some examples. So to conclude, I think hardware, software, data, and research have uh, revolutions have really enabled quite a few breakthroughs. Um, there's quite a few things I'm looking forward to really here. I'm just listing uh, a few. In machine learning, I think more impact in health. Um, this is something I was saying before pandemic, so it's even more relevant today. Or self-driving cars, these, these, these are big changes, I think, in society that um, hopefully create positive impact. Uh, supervised learning, I think lots of potential still from text-based models. It's a fascinating area. And another challenge that I see, as I said, is learning from few examples. I think this is critical that we do more research progress on this. And last but not least, in reinforcement learning, there is a gap between um, these simulated worlds, right? Like the games that we play and that these algorithms are managed to mastering. Um, but there's still a real gap between the simulated and the real world. Um, so I expect more and more breakthroughs in robotics, but this happens quite slowly. Uh, so with that, I think we can, we can do a few questions. You can always ping me on Twitter as well if you want to discuss any topic. Um, I'm happy to, to have a discussion, maybe more asynchronously since we, we're not in the same physical space. But yeah, thanks a lot. And um, any questions, preguntas, uh, muchas gracias. So this is one of the things that I, I so this this interaction, human interaction, not only in the, in the way of AI, but they also like, I'm, I'm missing a bit uh, yeah. like, to see the eyes of, of the audience and how they react. So I, I wanted to give you an applause. I'm thank sure you, everyone you. is applauding also at Absolutely. their homes. So, so thanks a lot. Uh, really, thanks a lot, Uriol. Uh, I, sí, hoy, bueno, y salto, salto Podem, al la, castellano. Podemos cambiar, no pasa nada. Sí, no, no. Es, um, porque o sea, yo creo que has hecho un, un ejercicio fantástico para explicarnos el, el por qué estamos viendo esta explosión ahora y nos has ayudado a acercar un poco, a ver un poco la, la cocina y en lo que estáis trabajando los grupos de, de I más D, que al final es lo, lo, lo que acaban impactando, ¿no? Es, es, es uh, también um, divertido ver, ¿no? Como muchas cosas que empiezan en el ámbito de cool projects o, o crazy ideas, ¿eh? sí. como vemos lo, los proyectos de, de juegos en Reforming Learning, a, al final acaban impactando en mejorar cómo, cómo funcionan las, las fábricas y los robots de, de hoy en día, ¿no? Eh, antes de, de pasar a... O sea, vamos a hacer un par de preguntas. Sí. Eh, una de ellas es, uh, es viendo lo que hemos visto, eh, yo la, la reformulo un poco a, 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 a mi manera, pero nos, nos has enseñado un poco la rapidez de la evolución de la investigación en, en la inteligencia artificial. Eh, lo que, la, la reflexión un poco que, 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 que veo yo. Eh, es, ostras, además o sea, hay una explosión en el mundo de la investigación en AI, sí, pero también estos, estos, lo, el periodo entre la investigación y la adopción por parte del mercado también está, se está recortando muchísimo. Eh, claro, eh, no sé, y, y que, quería preguntarte por si, si vosotros también lo veis y cuáles son estas, estas razones. Eh? ¿Nos has explicado alguna, algunas revoluciones? Evidentemente, ¿no? pues a, hay el, el, el estado de las tecnologías que permiten ¿no? pues a, a una opción a lo mejor más rápida. Yo luego también veo muchas empresas en nuestro entorno eh, que, están, que están fichando doctores, ¿de acuerdo? O sea, gente en la empresa también capaz de adoptar estas innovaciones de manera más rápida. No sé si, ¿cuáles son tus impresiones? ¿En qué discusiones sí. estáis? Si esto es cierto o no. Sí, yo creo que esto es un poco um, algo que aprendes... Uh, con la experiencia, ¿no? Un poco, un poco casi como, como los algoritmos que aprenden a partir de ver ejemplos, ¿no? Um, nosotros también aprende, aprendemos pues cada, cada día, cada mes, cada año a partir de experiencias. Um, la inteligencia humana es mucho más efectiva, no necesitamos um, tener millones de copias nuestras por el mundo para aprender más rápido, pero yo creo que esto es, sí, es muy importante y, y, y se ve un poco, ¿no? Con, con, te he dado un poco esa impresión de 
de, como de, de la, del momento de, del paper, de, de la idea de investigación, luego a, produ a, 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 pues a ponerlo en, pro en production, eh, ese gap sí que se está cortando y es básicamente porque tanto la empresa, ¿no? Por, porque pues en, la, en Google, ¿no? Pues hay, tenemos nosotros que somos de título, ¿no? Research scientists, pero tanto los investigadores como los... Uh, product managers que, que están pues metidos, yo que sé, en, en Gmail, ¿no? Eh, como los, los software engineers que están en esos equipos, pues ya se aprende un poco la comunicación, como, como pues, pues cua, cuáles son los deadlines que son asequibles, ¿no? Dada, dada que hemos tenido ya bastantes ejemplos de, pues, de algo que es una idea que puede funcionar, a, 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 pues, a Efectua, efectivamente luego ponerla pues en, en el buscador o en el servicio de email y así, ¿no? Entonces eso es, hay bastante experiencia uh, y quizás puedo compartir un poco pues lo que he aprendido, ¿no? Pues por ejemplo es muy importante cuando si estás haciendo investigación y es muy oh, pues un poco, un poco loca y tal, pues está bien, ¿no? Te pones muy creativo y tal pero cuando estás, si, si yo pues hablo con gente de productos y nos dicen, bueno, a ver, queremos, hacer, queremos solucionar este problema, ¿qué ideas tienes con Machine Learning? ¿no? Una cosa que, que, que he aprendido es que muchas veces las soluciones más fáciles acaban siendo las mejores. Entonces, casi es ir en contra de mi propio campo, que, que, que pues me viene alguien y dice, ah, tienes este modelo nuevo que parece muy chulo, yo lo, quere, lo queremos probar en, en, pues, pues pa, para mejorar este servicio, y siempre casi mi error es decirles, a ver, prueba lo, lo más trivial, los modelos lineares, prueba, prueba primero los baselines, ¿no? que, se, que, que llamamos, y cuando ya tengas un poco desarrollado, eh, pues qué tipo de, pues evidentemente cuántos datos tienes, si, si están muy, pues si la, las, um, las etiquetas son buenas o no y tal, luego ya pues sí que a veces hay necesidad de un modelo nuevo, de algo de investigación que, que pues se ha descubierto hace poco, pero en general como digamos como consultor interno casi, lo sencillo siempre es lo que acaba funcionando y lo sencillo obviamente cambia, ¿no? lo, lo sencillo hace unos años, ahora pues lo, es sencillo decir, mira, pues entrenas una Recurrent Neural Network o una LSTM o no sé qué, hace unos años esa, es, eso era, pues, oh, esto es muy complicado y ahora los ingenieros de esos mismos grupos de productos ya lo saben, ¿no? ya saben lo que es, ya saben cómo entrenarlo, entonces hay mucho aprendizaje también a nivel de, digamos, de cómo transferir ¿no? la, la, las ideas de investigación al producto. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Te, tenemos una, una pregunta de, de, de otro ámbito tecnológico, pero a ver si tiene impacto. Nos preguntan si, o sea, viendo todo el potencial de las nuevas aplicaciones que, 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 que están enabled de, por estos breakthroughs en AI, si, si ha, ha reflexionado sobre el impacto que podría tener con las nuevas tecnologías de comunicaciones 5G. Hmm. Sí, eh. La, la, la verdad que hay una tensión muy interesante. ¿no? Yo, yo, de hecho, estudié en la OPC, eh, ingeniero, ingeniero de telecomunicaciones, entonces, pues, un otro, otro si, si hubiera, digamos, um, me hubiera clonado y hubiera visto, a ver, ¿qué, qué, qué pasa si me quedo en telecos? ¿no? Pues, eh, es algo interesante. Luego, hay, hay como un paralelo muy interesante de ver, que es compresión de datos, con la, pues el, ancho, el ancho de datos um, que, que está disponible con de 3 a 4 a 5G. No, no soy, ahora no estoy muy al día, pero obviamente algo, algo sé de que pues sí, 5G pues es, 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 es ya mucho mejor que ADSL, por ejemplo, en términos de latencia y tal. Um, pero es un poco la tensión que algorítmicamente podemos comprimir los datos mucho más. De hecho, estos modelos de imagen... Um, de hecho, NVIDIA eh, hizo una demo que, pues en videoconferencia, porque ahora todos estamos casi viéndonos en videoconferencia, había una opción que creo que pasabas de, pues no sé si, si ahora mismo los, los, uh, los códecs que se usan de vídeo, pues quizás, pues me lo invento, ¿no? Pero a, era algo como de 200 kilobits por segundo que, que estás transmitiendo de, de imagen, Pasa, pues cuando es una cara y no es muy complicada, pasaban a 0,7 kilobits por segundo. 
con inteligencia artificial, ¿no? con, con deep learning, porque pues las est la estadística de las imágenes, si sabes que hay pues, um, una imagen natural, es mucho más fácil de comprimir que si dices, ah, voy a comprimir cualquier imagen. Entonces, hay una intención muy interesante que estamos comprimiendo mucho más y de otro lado, pues tenemos mucho más ancho de banda. Entonces, um, ya veremos, porque obviamente más ancho de banda es mejor, pero en realidad es, es, van en contra, ¿no? Es como quizás en unos años mandando casi nada de datos, podemos ver toda una película, porque pues, hay, hay un vector de una red neuronal que tú la, la pones en tu, en tu sistema y te crea toda la película, ¿no? Entonces, uh, es, es divertido pensar en esto, pero yo creo que la latencia sí que es muy importante, porque vamos a interactuar con, 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 con dispositivos, y en ese sentido sí que se nota, ¿no? Pues eh, cuando, cuando la latencia mejora, pues todos estos servicios, incluso pues si, estás en el, eh, si los coches se comunican los unos con los otros, que esto va a pasar, pues en algún momento va a empezar a pasar, va a ser importante, ¿no? Tener 5G. Pero el ancho de banda en sí, yo creo que nosotros vamos un poco en contra. Queremos usar menos, <ríe> aunque más está disponible, ¿no? Es divertido pensarlo en, en, de, ese, de, de ese ángulo. Uriol, voy a seleccionar una, una, una última pregunta porque est estamos un poco, un poco pa pasados de tiempo. Eh, eh, nos queda un poco, oye, yeah, de de después de StarCraft 2, ¿cuál es el siguiente proyecto en DeepMind en, en Reinforcement Learning? Y, y, y sobre todo, uh, si nos puedes dar de detalles, sobre todo si, si es un proyecto muy secreto. <risa> pues la verdad que en, en términos de, de, juego, de juegos, creo que hay algunos juegos que son interesantes y, y de hecho estamos pues eh, poniendo competiciones con Minecraft, ¿no? Que son juegos un poco más como abiertos, ¿no? No, no es una, una partida y ganar, ganar en uno contra uno contra un adversario, sino que es un poco más como, parece un poco como más del mundo real, ¿no? Pues estás, estás allí, te puedes coger, eh, pues en Minecraft, pues coges tus recursos, construyes casas y cosas así, ¿no? Entonces, es interesante, no estamos aún pensando en, en términos de juegos cuál es el siguiente, porque claramente StarCraft era uno de los más difíciles y más actuales. Um, y con Reinforcement Learning, um, una de las cosas que estamos empezando a hacer es cambiar, digamos, de juegos a, a ciencia, ¿no? a problemas científicos. De hecho, yo hice la, la titulación también en la OPC de matemáticas y es interesante ver cómo algunos de estos algoritmos eh, que se han desarrollado para, pues, por ejemplo, jugar a Go, cómo podrían usarse para descubrir pues, teoremas nuevos en matemáticas. Ah, también hay mucho trabajo eh, muy, muy, muy bueno en, en, en pues, cosas de proteínas. De hecho, una de las cosas que, que, que abrimos es la, una de las proteínas que está en el coronavirus, Um, usamos el sistema que, que ganó una competición hace dos años pues para dar cuál es la estructura ¿no? de, de, de esta proteína porque luego se pueden desarrollar pues um, se pueden desarrollar medicamentos que van y atacan a ese tipo de, de proteína entonces creo que de aplicaciones siguientes veo mucho eh, también en desarrollo de, 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 de medicamentos pero no sé si es muy secreto o no pero es, es muy early days no faltan bastantes años yo creo pero quizás ese espacio sería lo que yo veo um, que pues, en unos años quizás um, hay algunos descubrimientos chulos como, pues, oh, hemos ganado a tal y cual en, en, en algún juego. Perfecto. No, sí, seguramente la, la, la comunidad uh, social y, y mundial estará mu mucho más contento con estas, con estas sí, nuevas a, aplicaciones. Uh, Uriol, de nuevo, muchísimas gracias por tomarte el tiempo para compartir estos insights y, y tu visión con, con, todos, con todos nosotros. Otra vez, un, 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 un aplauso. Gracias esperamos, por eh, también. Pues esperamos verte por aquí pronto. Sí, sí, a ver, cuando, cuando me abran las fronteras otra vez. Muy bien. Venga, saludos a todos. Adiós, Uriol.